My name's Richard Carson, and I'm your chair uh, for the afternoon. Um, I run an organization called Asset Ireland. I've been working in the HIV sector for almost 20 years. Um, my own area of expertise is working with um, migrant-led faith communities around HIV. And um, I've been networking and, and working in joint projects with Dublin AIDS Alliance and, and now HIV Ireland in, in various ways over the years. What a lot of people don't know is that for about two weeks once, I actually worked for Dublin AIDS Alliance, as it was at the time. Um, there were some training sessions going on with undocumented migrants in Dublin around uh, workshops on sexual health and reproductive health. And I, um, I was asked to come in and help to facilitate. Um, it was exactly 10 years ago. There's a particular reason that I know the date. And the reason was that just before one of the sessions, with all the materials laid out and ready to go, um, 10 minutes before we started, um, everything set up, nervously preparing in my head, I got a phone call. And the phone call was from my wife. And I answered it and said, hi, she said, hi Richard, said, hi Valerie, what's up? And she said, I, I have some news. I said, oh really? Um, I just did a pregnancy test. I said, oh really? And, and? And it's positive, you're gonna be a dad. And so I, I'm, I'm thankful for that memory, it's sort of ingrained in the brain. Um, of all the topics that I happened to be doing that day and that workshop, the topic that I was addressing for the following hour was contraception. <laughs> so I think I am the only person in the world who, and I have this ingrained in my brain, heard the words, you're going to be a dad, with my ears, while my eyes were looking at a table filled with contraceptive paraphernalia. And uh, if you know anybody else for whom that's the case, then I'd, I'd love to meet them. But uh, so fond memories of the, I guess, my closest uh, link with, with HIV Ireland. We've got a range of fascinating speakers um, today, this afternoon. Um, what we're going to do, similarly to earlier, is we're going to have a question answer session at the end. Um, that is questions on any of the speakers. So if you have a question on an earlier speaker, please do write it down. We, we might get time to address it directly. Um, but we, we certainly will at the end. And also, before I forget, our, our first speaker is going to have to leave um, shortly after his talk. So um, we'll see when we get a chance for any questions for him, because last thing we want is people asking you a question when you're not in the room. Um, so we don't. So um, in terms of our profiles, let's go. Our first speaker then is Dr. Aston O'Carroll. He is a general practitioner based at Mountjoy Street Family Practice. Austin is also the founder of SafetyNet, a service designed to serve people who are homeless and other marginalized members of society who are finding it difficult to get a primary healthcare service from a GP. SafetyNet works with many community organizations, including Merchants Key Ireland, the Anna Liffey Pro Drug Project, members of the Roma community, and the Capuchin Day Center. So Austin, the floor is yours. Um, so since you're starting with contraception stories, I might as well tell you my one. Um, when I first started in the, uh, I was a, a doctor in the hospital. Uh, I was in the Coombe Hospital. And what you had to do was, at the end of their stay, you'd have to say to them, um, the, the mothers, um, you know, what, in terms of, sorry about this, I don't know why this isn't working. Slideshow, why is that? Resume slideshow. Why is that not working? From beginning, yeah. Oh, that's it, okay. Oh, so it is working, okay, yeah. It's just, yeah. Apologies, it's on the screen, it doesn't look like that. Um, so, when I was a, G, a young G trainee for a GP in the Coombe Hospital, uh, at the end of the Mother's Day, you'd always have to ask them about, you know, family planning. And I went out one day and I was talking to this young mother about family planning. And she said, oh, doctor, don't talk to me about family planning. And I said, why? She said, I used the pill. And she said, I got pregnant on the pill. She says, then I used the condoms and they burst. So I said, um, so she said, yes. Yeah. So she says, now I use the natural method. And I said, the natural method. And she says, yeah, I tell him to fuck off. <laughs> so... Anyway, I think it's probably the best method advocated strongly. <laughs> um, so, um, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Yeah, I started uh, in general practice, the Mount Joy Street family practice. 
and it's a real inner city practice with a lot of deprivation, um, a lot of drug misuse, and as a result, a lot of people with uh, bloodborne uh, viruses as a result. I also, the Mount Joy Street Family Practice provides services to the AIDS Housing Foundation. So, in fact, we would have um, a, a large, a lot, lot of, a lot, a large people, amount of people with HIV uh, attend us as GPs um, in that practice. Uh, as, I, as my very kind introduction, I founded Safety Net Ireland. I also founded the North Dublin GP Training Scheme, which trains GPs. It's the only one of its kind in the world to train GPs to work in areas of deprivation in the marginalised groups. And also, I founded the Partnership for Health Equity with Anne McFarlane and the HSE. So, I'm going to talk to you about today about stigma and how you deconstruct stigma. And I'm going to presume that you know nothing about uh, social constructionism or about stigma. So please, apologies if I am talking uh, at too low a level. Um, but when I start this session, I try and teach people about deconstruction, con social constructionism. And I always start with my trainees by saying, what is a chair? And they all say, I say, do you believe a chair is a real thing? And they all say, of course it's a real thing. So I say, oh, the classic test of whether something's a real thing is if you're a, an alien walks in the room and says, give me a, um, give me a uh, definition of a chair. I don't know why aliens always have German accents. Uh, but uh, give me a definition of a chair. And uh, they say, well, it's something you, that you designed for you to sit on. And I say, well, you can't include the intention of the designer in a definition, because how would an alien know what the intention of a designer is? And they say, well, it's something with four legs. And I say, well, hold on. I know lots of chairs that don't have four legs. There's chairs there without four legs. I say, OK, it's, it's things with legs that you, that you have a place to sit on. And I say, well, there's a table over there you can sit on it. And they say, well, it has a back on it. I say, there's a table over there with a back on it. There is no definition for a chair, because the only reason we know what a chair is because we've seen them all our lives. We walk into a department store and we see a strange something, but we see it's beside all other chairs in the department store. So we know, oh, that's actually a chair. So that's how we construct things socially. We learn things about what things are um, through I I human interaction. A lot of things don't exist as real things. So I tell my trainees things like um, the idea of justice doesn't exist as a real thing, and things like the idea of honor uh, they are not real things, and they're disappointing. Then I tell them, love is the most fabricated social construction of all, and they're all devastated, so they are. Uh, the concept of love, and that's obviously everybody has totally different uh, interpretations of what they think love is, because it's not a real thing, and that's what causes all our problems. <laughs> so I then go on to say, teach them about stigma, and I do it using disability, and I'm going to do the same with yourselves. And I do this exercise, which you could do with anything. You could do it with drug use, you could do it with the person with HIV. And the first thing I do is I throw up this phrase, disabled person, and I ask people, throw out as many words as you can think of for a disabled person. And they all say, oh, did you know, handicap, wheelchair, um, rights, uh, access, um, medicine, you know, um, uh, you know, unemployment. And, I, and they throw all these things, and then they throw out blind, deafness, etc. And then I say, OK, now do the same exercise with the term. Oh, sorry, did I, I pressed the wrong one. Do the same exercise, but I use the word person. And suddenly they will throw up the words family, boy, girl, man, woman, hope, employment, joy, life, romance. And when you compare the two, they're always incredibly di different. Um, because, and always the disabled person is much more negative, much more, even when they're trying to be positive, they do things like rights, etc. They don't, and so it's a, it still is, like I always say, here's me, I'm a person with a disability. Uh, and if you were asking me which of these two represents me, it's person, it's not disabled person. And it's an example of how to show us that we all have preconceptions of people. And when we have a preconception of someone that defines them, that overtakes. What, so when you see someone who's disabled, that becomes the predominant thing you see. Often when you get to know people with disabilities, you learn to get beyond that. But the first thing that hits you is the disability, and that is what defines the initial interaction. So when we're teaching um, about stigma, we tell everyone, everybody has prejudices, everybody has stereotypes. If you don't have stereotypes, you will live in a very unsafe world. If you don't have a stereotype of the fact that that person looks like a very aggressive driver, don't try and pass them out, you, then you could put yourself at risk. 
It is absolutely fair when you're walking down the street, if you see a group of lads who look dangerous, keep away from them. Yeah, you may be stereotyping, but it is a good way of navigating the world to know how to manage the world. If someone looks aggressive, tone down. Don't get aggressive back to them. Use your stereotyping to help you navigate the world. The problem with stereotype is when you start thinking that they mean real things, that they mean something about the person, or that there is not much more to the person than just that stereotype. So we all need ways of navigating the world, but we have to be very critical of those. So we teach everybody, everybody has stigmatizing attitudes, everybody has prejudice. It's just what the actual role in addressing prejudice is not getting rid of it, it's knowing what your prejudices are. So when I'm talking to patients from in the inner city, in inner city or I'm talking to a drug user uh, who's a patient of mine and I see them as a real person and then I find that they are, um, their urines are coming in dirty, they're obviously using drugs, they're after telling me a lie and then I become, well you shouldn't be doing that, so that's the wrong thing and I find myself becoming parental and uh, giving out, which I do quite frequently, I suddenly have to say, hold on, back off. That's because you need to be aware of your prejudice. I can't get rid of that. It is with me for life. And just to give you another example, I have prejudices against disabled people. When I first met people with disabilities, I started interacting, I was involved in the disability movement. I found myself difficulty interacting with them, not sure what you do with a person who's blind. Do you push a person with a wheelchair? How do you talk to a person who's got a speaking difficulty? And I became obsessed with this issue rather than just being able to interact with these people because I am a product of the same society as everybody else, filled with the same stigmatizing attitudes, even if they ultimately affect me. So, when we're looking at stigma, what we try and do is deconstruct stigma. And I'm going to again take disability as the template, but I'll bring it then to a number of other dis of, of um, stigmas uh, that we have or prejudices we have against certain groups. So the first one I take again then is, Ms. Sugar, I can't obviously operate a PowerPoint. Sorry. Apologies. Where is it? Oh, yeah, trip to the stars. Yeah, so imagine we all, this is the exercise I said, I'm going to deconstruct disability. Imagine we all jump on a rocket and we press a hyper button that says hyperspace and we go, boom, right off into the distance. And we end up many light years in a galaxy uh, between two planets and a sun. And we say, let's land on this planet. And we land and we find that, amazingly, it's the exact same as ours. It's got greenery, it's got animals, it's got... There you see a city, it's got a city at the same level of sophistication, and you find it's got people who amazingly speak English, and they, um, they've got the same bodies as are ours, they've got legs, they've got arms, they've got chests, mouths, noses, ears, but they don't have eyes. And I, say, I ask the trainees, how would the world differ? And they all say, okay, well, you know, it takes them a while, but eventually they cop on that, you know, there'll be no such thing as colour, there'll be no visual advertisements, be all oral advertisements or tactile advertisements. You mightn't have to wear clothes. Clothes might be more tactile, fashion would be tactile. Um, you mightn't, the big one they don't think of is they often don't miss that you wouldn't need glass, so you don't need glass or lights in rooms. And of course, everything would be braille uh, or oral, it wouldn't be done through writing. Um, and so as they're going through this, they might work at night time rather than daytime. I say, so let's say you were to get a job in this place. And they say, well, I can't read Braille and I can't walk around a building that's dark because I haven't learned how to do that. So I say, so what are you? And they say, well, I'm disabled. Um, so we say, okay, let's get out of here, jump on the rocket, go over to another place, exact same as ours, level of sophistication, the people have eyes, they have ears, nose, but they don't have legs. And they go around in things with, with wheels on them. And again, same thing, you know, there's no steps, there's no chairs, everything's wider. Um, then they realize doors would be much lower, shelves would be much lower. Then they realize there'd be no chairs anywhere, so they would have to sit down on the floor. And then you say, you get into a car, what would it be like? And they say it would be adapted. I said, hold on, it's not adapted, they're all the same, you know. And they say, okay, well, they said it, it would have um, hand controls. And I say, yeah, well, what's the most obvious thing would be different is you wouldn't need seats in a car. You just wheel your, wheel, your wheelchair onto the car and in. And they all missed that part um, because some things are so blindingly obvious, you miss them. Um, and again, you ask, how would you be? Well, you couldn't drive a car because you'd have to have an adapted car for you. You'd have to find seats in the special place for people who are disabled up at the front of the concerts or the football matches. Um, and of course, you would be bending down all the time so you get health problems from your disability. So it's making the point is that the environment is what disables people. We, if we create a society for people with two legs who can walk upstairs and who have eyes, ears, mouths and nose, that environment will disable people who don't fit that pattern. 
So that's my first deconstruction element. The second deconstruction I say is dyslexia. What is dyslexia? And they all say, oh, dyslexia is a problem reading and writing. I say, where's the problem? They say, in the brain. And I say, fine. So many you can't paint or draw. Many people here can't paint or draw. Okay, so what's your disability called? Why is there a disability called dyslexia, not one called dysartia? And uh, the reason there isn't one called dysartia is you don't need to be able to paint or draw to interact in society. You do need to be able to read or write. If we uh, lived in a society that communicated through painting or drawing, ye would have a disability and the people with dyslexia wouldn't exist. And I ask ye who can't paint or draw, do ye think of yourselves of having a problem in the brain? No, ye don't. Ye think yourselves of having different talents and abilities. To me, the world is a place where people have different abilities. My own son has dyslexia, and um, in fact, he was also told he had a, a, a hyperactivity disorder, attention deficit, and I said, actually, I don't believe in that. And when the psychologist came along, and they said, oh, that's a pity, they said, because he gets services with it. And I said, oh, I said, I'll take that down. <laughs> and uh, so, to me, and that encapsulates what to me labels are. Labels are to label differences that are where our society hasn't been designed to cope with. And we need to get extra services to those people. The problem comes when we think the label means anything more than that. So my son is an incredibly interesting, dynamic, imaginative, creative son. You, if you think of ADHD, you think trouble, prison, problems later on in life. Yeah, he's problems. What child isn't got problems? And yeah, he has particular problems that we have to manage. He's also got incredible creativity. Uh, so I think it's, once you start believing the labels mean anything more than that, that's when you have a problem. Um, I go on to also talk about learning disability, because people think learning disability is a real thing. And I say, how do you define it? And it's, it's defined by IQ. And the IQ is mild as 55 to 49, moderate 40 to 54, etc. And I say, why did they pick 55? And then they say, I don't know. There is no rational reason for choosing 55 versus 60 versus 40. We created the concept of learning disability because we have the concept that you have to be certain amounts of intelligence to interact in society. So that's how I deconstruct disability. Um, and uh, we use that, so okay, that's how you, disability is a social construction, it's not a real thing. But it has a real thing in the fact that it becomes, people think it's real, and then they give those attributes I described to you early on, handicap, difficulty accessing, you know, difficulty with life, and they forget to add the positive attributes to the person. And to give you an example of how potent this is, one of the things that can happen with stigma is that you internalize it. And I'll give you an interesting example of how I internalize my disability. Uh, people often said to me, you know, um, I don't think of you as disabled. And I would say the same. I don't think of myself as disabled. Um, and I used to say this for ages. And then I suddenly realized one day, why am I saying that? Because I obviously am disabled. So why did I say I don't think of myself as disabled? And of course, the reason is that I think disabled. This is talking about internalizing your prejudices, that we all have prejudices. Because I think disability is so negative that it means somehow you're an unsuccessful person, an unlovable person, a person who can't gain love, a person who can't uh, look attractive. I didn't want to be seen as that, so I didn't think of myself that as way, because I wanted to think of myself as successful, attractive, being able to get love. Um, so I couldn't realize that, hold on, being disabled doesn't mean you can't be all those things. So that's how powerful the, 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 the stigma can be. You can internalize it yourself. We see, and Tony works with me in the area of drug addiction, and all of, many of you do, I know that. And you see how people who are addicted to drugs internalize the blame um, discourse. You're to blame for your uh, drug addiction. So they start thinking they're to blame. I have talked to people who won't go to hospital, they say it's my own fault, uh, why I won't bother the doctors, so there's no point in going to the hospital. Um, and they also internalize the fact that, you know, they live a dangerous life. It's, you know, life expectancy for drug users and homeless people is very poor. And they internalize that that is right because I am to blame for this. So they will then not take care of their health because they don't deserve anymore. So that's the, the um, so in a sense, when we're deconstructing stigma, we need, to, we need to recognize these labels have huge internal effects in terms of on our effects on our own perceptions of ourselves. And then, of course, I'm not going to go into the effects so much strongly of the effects of other people's attitudes, because we all know the effects of other people's attitudes through stigma. 
Um, one of the things I did is I did a doctorate on health with Denise Proudfoot, who's here, and I did it on why homeless people didn't use health services. And one of the most powerful reasons they don't use health services is because of stigma. To give you a story, um, um, two clients of mine, um, let's call them Joan and, jo and John, uh, had been rough sleeping in a well-known inner city park, drinking vodka, taking uh, benzos, cocaine and, and heroin, a great combination. And um, they, one winter, last winter, around a year ago, they were out in the rain on a Sunday. There was no services open because there's no drop-ins open on the Sunday. Uh, he became very cold and started to become sleepy. They went into casualty. And as the doctor was slipping off his, 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 um, his clothes because he had hypothermia, he turned to her and said, isn't this disgusting? Um, Subsequently, he developed a very bad abscess and he wouldn't go to hospital because of that same attitude. And it's particularly ironic because that same guy is now totally drug-free, alcohol-free, living in accommodation on an access course to university. So the stigma didn't just make him feel bad, but it meant the health professional didn't have an opportunity to intervene and lost that opportunity to make a difference that luckily another health professional had that same opportunity. So it isn't just the negative effects of the stigma, it's the loss of the positive effects of not having stigma or prejudice and dealing with your prejudice. Uh, how am I on time, was Tony? Four minutes, okay. Then, sorry. And what will I go? I, sorry about this. I, the problem is that this isn't a correlation with up there. <laughs> uh, I've skipped over where I want to go. This is a strange way of doing it. I have to look up here. Um, I want to find the one where it shows stigma and prejudice in the same one. Have I got that? No, there. I'm going to go on to stereotype. Let's we slip through these. Um, where is it? There. I suppose just to clarify just a simple knowledge thing is that stigma refers to, the original guy, Goffman, saw stigma as a mark that, that's, you know, outmarked you as being different, and refers to unfavorable attitudes and belief directed towards someone or something. Whereas discrimination is the actual treatment of an individual or group with partiality or prejudice. So I may have stigmatic attitudes or prejudicial attitudes, but I don't. I keep them to myself and I just don't interact. It becomes discrimination once I act in a discriminatory fashion. And I think um, this is one of the key things we've, we've learned into providing medical services is that you have no idea the extent of discrimination you can have against other users. And again, I'm going to come to, I, I was going to go to HIV and think, well, I'm going to skip it because I think the, the learning from this applies to people with HIV. Um, but if I can give it to you from the homeless perspective, because that's where my expertise is. Um, for example, homelessness. Why do homeless people not use health services? First of all, physical barriers such as distance. Second of all, administrative barriers. Um, you know, if you have a, me a complex medical form, which is the medical card application, that will prevent you accessing services. And it will discriminate against those people who have dyslexia and who find it difficult. It will work positively in favour of middle class people who can use the system. If you have appointments uh, for homeless people, that will mean they won't attend hospitals, which suits hospitals because then they're less busy. And they say, well, I offered them an appointment. They've been sending appointments for years to homeless people. How ridiculous is that? Um, queues is, is fine for people who can wait. Everyone hates queues. It's a barrier for everyone. If you're addicted to drugs and go into withdrawal and have to leave, and when you come back, you're put at the end of the, the, the queue, or if you're addicted to alcohol, but at the end of the queue, that's a barrier. Um, stigma I've already mentioned. Um, rigid rules applied. Rigid rules, yes, they're to keep people safe. But also rigid rules mean, when you apply rigid rules to a group of people who have come up from family dysfunction where rigid rules were applied through stick and fist, their reaction to those rigid rules was to be react. So yes, you can say, I am being justified in applying these rigid rules and sticking to them. The, fact, the problem is you will exclude the most unhealthy and the people least most likely to die and most need of our health services. That's some of the physical, administrative, and there's attitudinal barriers as well. The internalized barriers are the most powerful. For a homeless person, if you think you're not going to live long, why bother taking care of your health? As one guy said, I'm 36, I've no family, I've no kids, I've no partner, what's the point in taking care of my health? I've nothing to live for. Um, if you think you're going to be affected by prejudice or stigma, you don't bother going to a service. If you think you're going to get poor treatment, you won't go to that service. So the level of discrimination that affects people is intense, and it, a lot of it originates in stigma. Um, that is, it, you know, it, like the people, 
you need to under you, you need the fact that a medical card form is so complex. If you weren't prejudiced against homeless people, you would actually look at how do I help homeless people. Forty-five percent of homeless people don't have medical cards. They should be looking at that form. So that's how deeply entrenched it is. They're so unaware of the stigma that they don't address the obvious barrier that exists. I think I've finished my four minutes now. I suppose, I think this applies to people with HIV because obviously stigma with HIV and the social construction of a person with HIV is very intense and has led to a lot of discrimination as well. And apologies, I wasn't able to touch it on specifically. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. Um, while those challenging thoughts are, are fresh in our minds, can I invite you to ask Austin any questions? I know he's going to have to leave, not right now, but, but shortly. So um, wh while that's all fresh, has anyone in the room got a question for, for, for Austin? Well, um, I'll ask a very quick one because I know it's sort of links from earlier. We, we saw in some of the evidence from the research earlier that, that uh, Caroline was presenting that people living with HIV one setting maybe surprisingly that they experience stigma is the healthcare setting. And so maybe if you could say a little bit about that in the context of your GP training or, or about the need for change. Uh, yeah. uh, I, mean, I think the, the problem in, it's not, it, it, it is surprising, but to me it's not surprising because unfortunately stigma is rampant through the medical professional. In medical professions are basically middle class people with middle class attitudes. Um, so, um, I think, and obviously it's a sector that should be open and address it, open to everybody. Um, I think people with HIV need to be constantly making this aware because obviously it's so critical. Um, I do sometimes think there's a segregation into infectious diseases, and in fact infectious diseases have somehow got stigmatized in the area of medicine. Um, and uh, so, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, I've seen it myself, I've seen people with HIV not being able to access services, I've had to ring up and advocate on their behalf. If they, and I know, and I don't want to equate, because there's a danger of equating people with HIV with people with drug use, but only recently I had someone with HIV who had drug use but was developing a mental health problem, and they wouldn't see him, and they told me, tell him to go to the drug clinic, and they can refer him to the psychiatrist or to the infectious disease clinic to get to the psychiatrist. They shouldn't have to do that. They should just get their mental health addressed. So I fully agree with it and keep fighting it. And if you want any support, we'll help you too. <laughs> Thanks, Austin.